Wig, did you just say wig? Wig, okay. Hi, kids. Oh, we're recording. <laughs> yes, we're recording. <laughs> I don't know. I'm kind of out just, of it today. We just set up that whole thing. Okay, well, hi. Um, I'm Martyr. I'm C. Tepper. And this is Wigging Out. March uh, edition. March edition. Um, after a uh, treacherous February for me. Uh, <laughs> pretty bad for everyone well it was definitely worse for you I yeah mean, i was gonna say want to talk about that yeah I could, um i had corona again part two <laughs> part two electric boogaloo um so that was fun but i'm recovering now she's I'm alive barely but i'm here but yeah um welcome to um year two of quarantine <laughs> literally yeah. it's it's been a year uh, but um, unlike last year, we're still recording during this time. Um, yeah, that's true. Because we just stopped recording. I know. <laughs> the world ended. <laughs> um, I think we should introduce our guests. Who are we doing today? Caitlin. I agree. Um, so all the way from another digital show, Dragbox TV, we got Sissy Walken. Hey, hey, hello, hello. Our New York Sissy. Our New York Sissy. <laughs> <laughs> New York Sissy. Wait, where's the other ones and who are they? Oh we don't know. <laughs> oh we don't have friends. That's true. I Crazy. would like to say that I'm very honored to be New York City's one and only Veronica Green lookalike. Oh, I was like, should we even talk about that? Because I feel like no one cares about Veronica anymore. I love her. I want her to win. She's coming back. Yes. I know, but, yeah, I, but I, I heard Juno you know, Birch is going to be on, so like... Ooh, that's some tea. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. It's going to be crazy. I'm shocked they would... Well, they're like more um, lax with um, not letting trans people on, like outside of the U.S. Even with RuPaul there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. They're like more relaxed about that, but besides Got Mick, but that doesn't count. Um, it's weird. Yeah. So I hope Juno does get on. That'd be nice. Um, yeah, I was thinking about that the other day. I, I don't know who I said it to, um, but I said that you look like Veronica Green or vice versa when I was watching. Um, I think the Cats musical one, that's where I saw it the most. <laughs> but, or the Rats I'll take musicals. it. I'll take it. You know, <laughs> for all these years, people were like, oh, you're like a little Laganja, but not a dancer. And I was oh, like, oh, I don't no. do that at all. That's the worst. I, I don't like, see that like in any way <laughs> oh i i got it a little bit when i first started dragging i was like gross i gross. don't see it <laughs> all no. right so our first topic how has life been in the year of this pandemic obviously <laughs> hard <laughs> um i feel like you've been busy though you know uh i do that because it's the only way i work uh mm -hmm. I just couldn't not do anything. Um, I wasn't going to let coronavirus rob me of, like, the path that I had set for myself. Mm -hmm. um, like, no, I wasn't going to... I wasn't going to stop for nobody. Um, or no virus. Uh, <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, I guess I've been busy. Um, I also feel like I haven't applied myself in the same way I wanted to. And I feel like... I was just watching it. You don't people. need to like put stress on yourself though. No, I do think there's so much like, oh God, I was home all this time. Like I didn't do so much of this stuff, right? Like I'm currently, yeah. as you can tell behind me, going through a clean out of this. Ah, it looks here. Good. No, look at, look at all these wigs got to go up on a wall and I just haven't done, you know what I mean? And I'm like, damn, these are projects I've been sitting on for months. And, but, uh, better late than never. Yeah. Just, um, Honoring the process and honoring the journey um, is really the lesson of quarantine. Sure. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Uh, it's but it's it's a challenge and it's a learning experience. And I am um, seeing a therapist now. I have been oh, for a good. few months, and uh, it feels great. That's um, important. Mental health number one. Yep. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah. Obviously, nothing's perfect or fixed yet, but. Uh, 
you know, what are you going to do? You just got to keep... You got to keep gotta, chugging gotta, along. Got to well, keep going. Gotta, yep. <laughs> Um, and yeah, uh, just setting priorities straight too, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. something like healthcare has become a real, um, glaring, like priority for me in my future. And mm -hmm. I'm making steps and choices based on that. Um, I, I understand a hundred percent on that one. <laughs> and then putting yourself first, you know, mm -hmm. that's also kind of what Corona has taught us is like, you cannot be waiting for anybody. You yeah. have to, you have to chart your own path and go your own speed and just worry about you mm -hmm. <laughs> this is such good advice <laughs> I, no i was like I was taking say, down notes <laughs> i was gonna say i've had such bad fomo lately because i've seen like girls that i like started out with like getting on tv and like shooting magazine covers and shit during corona and i'm just like what have i done except get sick twice <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, everyone yeah. has their own their own story and it's at their own different times and um you can choose for like you can choose to like compare your story to others or you can like make your chapters as um exciting as possible while you're living it, you know. Um but you you can't sit still anymore either and that's mm. like look at all this little bit of time that we have to do the things we want like mm -hmm. that's true if we want to do them let's do them um why 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 are folks i don't know why is the why is the drag community so slow to respond to some things why are why are drag artists so so reluctant to change uh it's it's something i see everywhere i question it for myself mm -hmm. um it's been like a real light about this business. Who do you want to work with and why? That's so true. That is some That's deep, cheap. deep thoughts. We're getting deep early in the podcast. <laughs> I know. I'm like, I I'm not sorry, I smoked a lot of weed this morning and I'm in my feelings. And <laughs> I support it. I it's, my, it's, my weekend, it's my weekend off. So I'm like. Oh, yay. You're spending it with us. <laughs> um, when I smoke, I am like non-functional i i had to do it late at night because otherwise i will not do anything <laughs> oh i was in the middle of four different tasks before this started and i was like i gotta sign on i, gotta... <laughs> I know mm -hmm. so starting from the beginning i feel like your italian heritage is very like important to you and i know you grew up in baltimore i believe no i grew up no? in new jersey no new I'm, jersey. A, I'm a jersey girl through and through I'm okay jersey. jersey but if i had to pick obviously i'm picking the north we ain't going with those <laughs> in jersey crazy Ooh. what crazy. part of jersey uh it's somerset county so if you put okay. your right where you think the middle is that's where i'm at gotcha gotcha, gotcha. um and uh yeah i love I love my hometown and like the area because it's so sentimental to me, but mm -hmm. most of my family has kind of moved out of the area or gotcha. is moving out. Um, the town has changed dramatically. Um, they have, their local government has really been destroyed by the Republican party. Yeah. Um, I, it's like, Jersey is a very strange place right now. Yeah. People are like, no, Jersey's blue. And I'm like, yeah, mm. on the, when it matters, but Jersey, yeah. Jersey doesn't show up for local elections. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why these school boards are so messed up. And mm -hmm. um, it's it's a shame. I feel like my political activism makes me want to go back home. But like... Sometimes it's a lost cause. I'm from Staten Island. It's a, it's a lost cause. cause. Like, there's I'm nothing just like, you could do. <laughs> I just don't think... You know, I don't... Why am I... It's like going back to... Uh, your um your abuser you know what i mean it's like going back to it's going back to that person that did you yeah. wrong for so long and thinking that like you can you fix can them yeah <laughs> yeah you can't fix them you That's know they're going to be who they're going to be i got i got the gay version of the not in my backyard you can be gay just not in my house oh no um, you know, and that's something that queer people, I think, deal with a lot as children, where, like, you're friends with kids whose families may not be okay with it. Mm -hmm. And how does that kid deal with that friendship knowing that their parents aren't accepting of it? Yeah. Um, you know, I just finished up nannying a five-year-old, and you see so much variety in these children and the way they express themselves. Mm -hmm. Um. And then you see some of these parents and some of these attitudes and you're like, mm, we may not be as far ahead as we think we are. Oh, no. 
no, definitely not. <laughs> so it's, uh, yeah, I like to, if you haven't been able to tell, I like to like take the world and experience it and learn it. You don't see me much on social media. I'm not that girl. Mm-hmm. You know, I post my things and I actually have the picture to post after this, but I'm not that, I'm not that queen. I'm not showing you every bit of my life. I'm not making oh, yeah. content like crazy. I'm like soaking in the world because then you can use what you learn in a positive way instead of mm-hmm. a superfluous way that just disappears in a few minutes. So or- what got you into drag? Um, I've always loved like fabulous, gorgeous women, um, (laughs) in like beautiful dresses with stunning hair. Um, I guess, uh, Vanna White and Susan Lucci were like, like full on, uh, like TV icons. I saw them like every day growing up. Shania Twain, Celine Dion, Beyonce were like the, the, uh, Britney Spears were people I listened to as a kid that like Mm -hmm. really, uh, had me falling in love with the female voice, the female image. And, um, I was, I, you know, I had spent many years working in the theater and I still do work in the theater from time to time. Yeah. And, um, I was already learning how little, um, of a path there was for me. What did you want to do? Obviously like act, I guess. I'm a, I'm a singer and I'm a storyteller. Okay. So I love the art of musical theater and I love the art of cabaret and mm-hmm. I love telling story through song. Um, whether that is through the context of a musical, whether that is through a solo show, uh, mm-hmm. a, a song set, um, very much it's about storytelling and weaving your story through your work. Um, and I just wasn't finding that characters in Broadway shows for people my age, my build, my voice Mm -hmm. don't exist. My experience, my story doesn't exist on Broadway. Um, And if it does, it's so, it's, it's so few shows. And then there's so many of us gay guys and we're like, those roles. And then you're not going to get seen for some of that stuff. And it's like, it just felt like you were really, again, playing into that hand of the person who treated you like shit for so long. And then Mm -hmm. you're like, no, I'm just like, I'm just saying like, no to that BS. Like I blaze my own pathway for my life instead of following an idea of what I learned in theater school and before, you know, I can be whoever I want. And I, discovered drag through the local scene here in New York. I mean, I didn't really go to the bars in college. I went to college at Marymount Manhattan for musical theater. Oh, right next I, to Hunter. <laughs> right next to Hunter. That's where I went. And, yes. I did, did I not know that? I felt I like I, so. I don't think I knew that about you. That's amazing. Uh, we probably like crossed paths and had no idea. No, because I- Oh, no, wait, no, wait. I, <laughs> I do remember that. I'll now. pretend we did, <laughs> but that's definitely- Because you look so fucking young. I don't. <laughs> yeah, so um, yeah, uh, went there and I actually worked a lot in college, uh, like part-time work. Like I was doing a lot in retail at the time and really thought for a moment that that was where I was going to build my money on the side while I was being an actor. And then um, my priorities shifted because I was working at um, the Hangar Theater one summer and um, I really realized like, oh, wow, there is such like, a path for yourself to make. There is like a, uh, a vision of me that I can grow to see, uh, or I can ignore it. And I chose to be the person who I wanted to be and the artist I wanted to be from that experience. And I was doing retail. I was working at Saks Fifth Avenue selling men temporary. I was selling that is some good, um, what is it? Commission. <laughs> no, no, um, it wasn't commission based. It was commission based, but it was not good. Oh, um, not sometimes good. was good and sometimes was not. And you really yeah. were working for your checks and it was really. Oh, that sucks. I, I mean, you're, you're talking about a retail market, big box retail dying. Um, yeah, and that's, that's high end point. stuff that people can buy online anyway. Yeah. Um, and so if you're, you know, and they didn't want you to participate in the online stuff because they had inventory in the stores, they needed you to move. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Um, I was really, I, I was, I was really like 
thinking that was going to be the thing. And then it wasn't. I left Saks and I went to work at, um, where did I go after Saks? Did I go to Ralph after Saks? Again, I, I was working at Ralph for a moment. Then I went, I left Ralph to go to Saks. And then I don't know if I, if that's how it worked. I don't remember the exact timeline. Worked oh, at a bunch of places. <laughs> Eventually said F it. And I, uh, started working, uh, in restaurants um, mm-hmm. and then um, I was working at Alice's teacup for a little bit oh, I, was working, boss. <laughs> I was working for today ticks for a little bit oh another good job I mean I don't know if it's a good job but I like and, those <laughs> um, and then I booked my tour and then I booked my tour and, that and was I was also doing work, I was right? also, yeah I was doing background okay. work before that too I was like doing film background stuff and some cater waiter stuff, which actually I just got on to another, um, what are they called? Those lawsuits. Um, c- uh, class actions where, yeah, yeah, yeah. yes, I just, uh, one of the catering companies I worked for wasn't paying us tips and I knew they weren't <gasps> doing it anyway. Oh um, my God. Cause I've done some <laughs> similar work and that's horrible. I got reached out to from some lawyers, uh, and I filed a claim. I'm not going to get much money, but yeah. I, yeah, good. Uh, thank you. I'll take it. Thanks for yeah, some. Whatever for some. it is. <laughs> yeah. So um, that's that. And so then I booked this theater works tour and that's where really, really, really life was like it, uh, ch- changed because I did not think I wanted to go on a theater works tour because I thought you had to take your equity card and I was not about to take my union card knowing that I was not going to do a lot of union based work. Mm-hmm. Um. I was, uh, I was like, I'm going to stay in New York. I'm going to be in New York. And then I got this chance to like drive around America. And we went from here to St. Louis, to Dallas, West, uh, to uh, Telluride, Colorado, down to Vegas, all up California, uh, basically up to Alaska in fucking Washington state. Then we drove all the way back West through Wyoming and Kansas. And I got to see Mount Rushmore and, uh, uh, it was the most literally cool six months of my life. And wow. I want to tour again like crazy. Um, but, you know, Corona. Um, I played two girl characters. I played the mom. And I also played the Wicked Witch. Um, and I was playing this role for children. And people would be like, are you a boy? And I would just say yes. And they'd be like, Okay. and that's actually where a moment in my life where it changed where I was like oh my god like this is our future here like these they are really like not phased by this and Mm -hmm. grown ups are so phased by this yes Um, and I just kind of thought to myself well I feel like that gender expression that I wish I had in my life I wish was there and I want to make that be part of this thing happening yeah like this thing called drag that is blowing up in the electric age and um i really think that i can still i'm not done yet but eventually change lives through that right um i i I could as a tya actor and who knows what else is gonna come yeah so how did you come up with the name sissy walker um so I wanted something that was like more like a in your home kind of a name, not mm-hmm. like uh not like a name that was very vulgar, uh, which my mind tends to <laughs> words. Um so I wanted to like watch out for that. So I yeah. tried to pick things that also paid homage to like my history. So at one moment I was gonna do something called Sandy Hills, which was um my uh my mom and my grandmother are both named sandra so i thought like playing on that would be cute but then i was like nah and then i i like you went by sicily at first sicily walk in and because i like the sicily is homophony with um italy and then i remembered i'm from naples so (laughs) (laughs) So i couldn't use that one and i was at the bar and i was kind of like just call me sissy and it actually hit me at first. I kind of was like, oh, I don't know if I want that. And um, someone from the cast I was touring with also said it. And it also made me go, Ugh. 
And I had a coming to Jesus moment where I was like, you know what? No, I was called a sissy for so long by so many people and it made me feel terrible and I let them have that power over me and it fully dehumanized me and made me feel small and I'm taking it back. And that's how we landed on this. And I, I'm not changing it. I kind of like my last name, Walken, because if you s rearrange some of the letters, you start to spell my last name or can get close to it if you break the W in half and split it around. And uh, it's kind of, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of nice. I was kind of like, my father also told me many, many years ago because he knew I will when I was a kid, I had also dreams of being a star, but a different kind of star. Yeah. And my dad was like, you know, your our last name is a little tricky to pronounce. You might need to get a like pseudonym, basically. Yeah. Um, so this was actually something that I had heard as a kid, like it would be okay to get if I was to become someone like a news anchor, like I thought I wanted to be when I was a kid. Um, so I thought your name was like a cross between like Sissy Speak Sick and Christopher Walken. <laughs> Mm -mm. Love that. <laughs> I actually yeah, I don't. don't I don't know that I especially don't know Sissy Spacek's work enough. Obviously, I know Christopher I'm, Walken's. I'm like, I hope you know Carrie at least. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. All that matters. Like, <laughs> okay, as long as that's the only one you need to know. That's honestly, I mean, my mom's a huge Sissy Spacek fan, but that's like the only one that matters. Okay, great. <laughs> obviously, I seen Carrie. Um, <laughs> it's. I mean, it's. It's fine. It's fine. It's great. It's great. It's great. It's a great, it's a great movie. It's like not one. It's not some a movie that I watch like all the time. Um, but uh, yeah, I've seen it once. I like. Um. I love Christopher Walken. Um, in SNL stuff. Yeah. Of uh, obviously, cowbell. Like, come on. Uh, it's just everything he does. He's delightful. But uh, I also love I love the Natalie Wood story. Oh, oh Lord. Oh, God. <laughs> Every time people bring up Christopher Walken, I'm like, yeah, but can we talk about Natalie Wood? <laughs> oh, we love a true crime. Oh. Yeah, I mean, that was uh, our last episode on this podcast, so. Uh, oh, my gosh. <laughs> That's for that last one. So we'll speaking do of celebrities, you I remember first seeing you doing Amy Winehouse, and that's obviously an impersonation you've done early in your career. How did that all happen? So I was doing Amy. Um, I first started doing that uh, at the Stonewall one night for Polish the Queen. Ah. I had been working on this. I had um, Kenneth, Perspective Beats, build this hair for me. I was like, I have these wigs. This is how I want them to go together. He put them together. He made me this thing. And I was reaching out to people to help me, like, do some vocal training, and no one got back to me. And, um... Ooh. I know. So I just kind of, like, tried to work on some things of my own, and mm -hmm. took some training I had from college in dialects, and started applying it to singing, and started really listening like hardcore to what she was doing not just like as an as a regular listener who like cries but like you know like a technician so mm -hmm. listening to the small boop 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 like all those small things that she would do and eventually thought i was ready to try it out i'd been lip syncing non-stop every week at all these drag shows at all these little fucking competitions and I did Amy that night, and I won. The Ooh. Week, that week at Polish, it was the first time I ever won anything, was at the Stonewall. And was uh, everyone who was there was really supportive of me. Phil Chanel and Christy Blaze and Fifi and Godiva. Um, they were folks who were there to see the Sissy at the beginning, and Tuesdays were always a better day for me to go do mm -hmm. drag. Um, because I had, was working in the neighborhood, and so I always was going to polish every week. And um, they really, like, lifted me and said, like, no, baby, this is what you're supposed to do. Uh, ah, they were like, like they were like, you're not a dancer. You're a singer, and you're a, you are that storyteller that you wanted to be. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's where I met DJ Chauncey through that show, and then everyone at the Stonewall, who I call fam, and uh, and then I did a bunch more competitions and lost every single one. But you did win one, and we're going to put a little commercial break in between and talk about it. When we yeah, um, <laughs> I think we're at a good time to take a break, yeah. and we'll get right back into that. So yeah. we'll be right back, kids. Bye! Wait, did you say wig? <laughs> wig, okay. 
feel that already. Wig, okay. Wig, did you just say wig? Wig, okay. <laughs> I am ready for my wig to go fly. And we're back. We're back. Ooh, that was such a long break. So long. <laughs> <laughs> Those messages were really important. Too. Yeah, super important. Super, important. <laughs> super, super important. I'm a busy, busy business woman. Apparently, send all good vibes to Martyr. Oh my God! This upcoming week. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Hopefully, <laughs> fingers crossed. Yeah. Um, but yes, let's get back into Sissy. Um, Stonewall. Um. I, I remember seeing the infamous video of you winning Miss Stonewall 50. I believe it was 50, right? Yeah. Um, That's right. It was. How was that experience? Uh, you want to talk about <laughs> things coming full circle? So much had come full circle in that moment. From every competition I had tried to win and lost to every bit of my journey from being a kid in... In New Jersey, who was trying to figure out where they were supposed to go in this world to like realizing in that moment you were in the right spot and you made the right choices and you got to the place you were meant to be doing the right thing, doing the thing you were supposed to do. Um, it is the biggest piece of pride I have as a queer person. Um, and there probably will be nothing else that comes in my life that could possibly match what it means to, uh, to just have the the ability to get to represent the bar and the landmark, um, I guess I kind of still do. But I, you know what you I mean. You do. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I do, but at the same time, um, the you know things are just opening up again, and it's mm -hmm. I, I I do as much as I can, but I feel like at this point we really should be on to another person. I um, think that competitions are gonna not happen for a little bit just it's just too many other people involved i don't i don't think they will happen either and i mean we still continue to do the work and i will obviously be missed on wall 2019 50 for whatever and ever however how long <laughs> to do the i am not obviously i'm not stepping down without a replacement at all but oh, i yeah, of course you think i do think we're due time for a replacement and i do believe that that person should be a a queen of color um or um a non cis presenting man when he's had a drag, um, you know. Um, I just think, I just think like it's time, and I think it's time to pass the torch on. I've seen so many queens come through, like that. I'm like, yeah, it would be amazing if you could have this opportunity, so you could do the outreach work that you've wanted to do, mm -hmm. right? I see people with big hearts in the community that all they need is a platform to be able to get access to resources. Um, I've been grateful to have those opportunities and work with Sylvia's Place, and um, I got to speak at a UN uh, panel, uh, not a panel, a, um, a ceremony for uh, refugees, uh, oh. for queer uh, refugees, and, um, so they're keep like let's continue that let's continue opening those doors for queer artists who are looking to make a change i think hibiscus and i um both kind of changed that title from being something that you just compete for in a talent show to something that you run for as a message like the, that it means something to the community when this person takes on this this uh, this position and that they have some type of wielding power right you you don't you don't demand power you earn it and i think the succession of girls over time have really worked to earn respect for what they do as an artist what they do as a community builders and so now it's time to give that to somebody else who is committed to that fight you know I, i'm i'm anxious to do it not to take anything off my back but to make that more change and you do that by changing because change is good <laughs> you should run as like um the next marty gold cummings oh i love marty <laughs> and everyone everyone should vote for marty um it, i volunteered for, are, um, if you're district seven if you're yeah and if you're district seven you're voting for marty if you're district 22 please vote for tiffany caban um 
And if you are uh, the House Kitchen District, you're going to vote for Eric Botcher. And if you are Queens uh, District with Sunnyside and Woodside, uh, that's District 26, you're voting for Amit Baga for City Council because we need a progressive and a queer City Council because all of these amazing people like Jimmy Van Brammer um, and Corey Johnson are being term limit out. So that's the fight for New York right now. Um, okay. And there's a lot of people in the primaries. In yeah, and this is also a mayoral year, um, yep. and, and it's going to be a governor year for New York. So New York, we really, we have it on ourselves now to take control again of our government. Um, I'm so y'all got to vote. It's not in November, y'all. It's in like June. <laughs> June. I if you're a here. registered Democrat, <laughs> if you have not registered yet, do it. <laughs> if you're not registered, uh, private message me and I will direct you to uh, a way that we can get you signed up. I have papers, like the voting registration papers. So all you have to do is uh, fill it out and mail it and uh, things will start to happen. You're good I, still, to go. I still vote in Florida, so I can't. But... <laughs> all of these races, because I'm registered in Staten Island, pretty much don't like have anything to do with me. But if you're a Brooklyn, Queens, Manhattan based... 100%. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, no, but also at the same time, you but stay in Staten amazing. Island. You stay in Staten Island, and you stay in Florida. <laughs> no, exactly, exactly. Uh, <laughs> yeah, especially uh, I had come from a uh, dangerous district, I guess. <laughs> in terms why? of why, uh, just the people that come out of it are oh. uh, what gross and corrupt. No, oh, they're gross Republicans. and corrupt. Yeah, they're so gross. same thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> same thing, but um, yeah. So from one historic venue to another, you've done a lot of work with the Lori Beachman Theater. It, I'm, it's kind of like, I don't know what's going on with it right now with them. Um, so they, they <laughs> raised a significant amount of money on their New Year's Day show. Oh, great. Um, they had an amazing lineup of people. Um, get, uh, show face and then people, a lot of great people gave money. Um, and God bless them and good for them. Um, they are, they should be f here forever. Uh, Agreed. I'm, I cannot believe that the Lori Beachman is the place that I get to say I cut my teeth at. Yeah. That is, that is like, what the Well, it was so unusual because it's usually like much more like seasoned performers, like more like gay household names. I and know. The view there was like incredible. <laughs> Yeah, and it was a lot of pressure, and I did a lot of it by myself, and then I had Aria help me a lot with just, like, getting from place to place, and... Um, there's no backstage. <laughs> there's no backstage. I have assisted projects there. <laughs> and then we did The Simpsons there. Um, yes. And that was a project that I had kind of... They wanted me to do something with Marge because Chip Duckett came to see iconic and that's how he saw marge and amy in the same night and was like ah. you can do both of these things and you know i'd done the amy and they liked it and they were like you know we're still waiting for marge and i was like <sighs> so i talked to them and i was like look i cannot do a solo show by myself as mm -hmm. much like i think this is a family story i think that it's all of them you have to give me the the space and the grace to do this yeah and they said okay and so the five of us worked together and put this really unbelievable production of The Simpsons out. And I couldn't have been more proud of it. Um, it was at moments like sloppy and unpolished, but it had all the potential. Uh, and the writing that we did together as a team while challenging to do was ultimately worth it. Um, I don't remember a time in recent memory, getting those kind of big laughs and applause since working in like high school or community-based theater. Um, and to be getting those laughs in a New York City venue was like, oh fuck, we are, we did something cool here. And you guys were super successful. It kept like selling out and like mm -hmm. doing more dates. So funny story, first night we ever did it, we sold 11 tickets. Oh no <laughs> angela mansbury was in the front row <laughs> and was our biggest fan mm -hmm. and loved it and went and told people and sherry poppins was also there the first night mm -hmm. and loved it and told people 
And it was a word of mouth kind of growth. We had this beautiful visual package that Emmy Gray did for us. Mm -hmm. And um, we had like kind of this idea of like explaining like what this show was and people were like, what? And then we did it and we got it filmed and then word of mouth started building. And then our last two shows sold out and that was, it's just like, it was so awesome to see the community show up and be like, oh, yeah, this is fucking great. And I'm so glad I got to see this. Um, like, and wow. it's a huge accomplishment because I've worked with the Laurie Beachman kind of extensively. And certain drag race girls who have the big names, they cannot sell it out. <laughs> they, um, some girls do, some girls don't. Yeah. So um, you should, you guys should be very, very proud of yourselves. We are proud of ourselves. We want to do more with it. We hope to. Yeah. Would you bring it back to the Beachman? If we do, we've always we've there. had talks of other types of shows we want to do. <laughs> One of them is the Treehouse of Horror. <gasps> That'd be so good. We would call it obviously the Clubhouse of Doom. Um, <laughs> of terror. <laughs> of terror. Uh, uh, something where we just can't get in trouble. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and. Uh, we have some few ideas. I will say the one idea that I have, I'm not going to give away the rest of my Ooh. team's ideas, but the one idea I have is to obviously recreate the iconic uh, Marge getting impregnated from the aliens in the first Treehouse of Horror. <laughs> That's where you first meet the aliens as Marge gets pregnant with Maggie from them. Um, so there's like a whole, there's a whole scene to have there. Uh <laughs> Jeez. And I kind of know who I'd want to play the, to play the aliens, um, but we'll see where it happens. We'll see what happens when it happens, if it happens. But we love our. It'll show. happen. It'll happen. We have. I mean, look. There's so many cool things to still touch with that, like that we didn't get to touch. We love the idea of Malibu Stacy. Where does yes. she play into this? We really only got to touch on Malibu Stacy. Um, we only just got to talk about Edna Krabappel. We did not include Cat Lady. Like, as a show that's very dominated by male characters, mm -hmm. um, we have, uh, we have, we are trying to focus on all the women, but like, then again, it opens this opportunity to bring, uh, our drag king friends on board to play okay. some of these men, uh, because there are so many of them. Yep. <laughs> uh, and, uh, build it and expand it and uh, continue grow 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 right like that's the goal of everything um but again the what did the pandemic teach us folks in time with time mm -hmm. and you've been pretty busy during the pandemic figuring out how to do drag we're gonna take a little break and talk about that when we come back we'll be right back kids Bye. Bye. Did you just say wait? Wig, okay. I know, wig, I feel that already. Wig, okay. Wig, did you just say wig? Wig, okay. <laughs> I am ready for my wig to go flying. And we're back, kids. We're back. Such a long break as usual. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same for everyone who listens. <laughs> I know. Um, once we get those ad spots, though, I know, right? <laughs> I, I think Bob and Monet are making some serious bank. And their Patreon, like, they're making, I think they hit 10,000, like, followers on Patreon. Mm -hmm. Something insane. Maybe we should switch to Anchor, because, or one of the Anchor. podcast apps, you can um, ask for ads, and you can get start getting paid for it. And it's mm -hmm. just, like, an app that you use, like, uh, recording device. So we'll look into it. That's on you. <laughs> hey. I don't know what that is. Listen. <laughs> Zoom's fifteen dollars a month, and I Mama's know. broke. <laughs> I know. I well, I don't mind helping pay for that. I know, but <laughs> we'll figure it out. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> that's probably not getting included. So, oh, it is. <laughs> oh, okay. Welcome back. <laughs> so, Sissy's been busy in quarantine. You did your digital show, Penne, for your thoughts. Yeah, I what did. Was that about. <laughs> Um, it was a cooking show in my kitchen where uh, I was just making some of my favorite things, teaching y'all how to do it and um, giving you my advice as we go along. Um, it had a lot of potential and then ultimately flopped. I was, you know, building something at the top of pandemic and my mind was all nuts. And I was mm -hmm. working with a guy who 
um, we didn't work well together, as we learned. And um, it happens. I now realize what that show could be. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there are other people who do it, though. You and can always really, bring your own sissy twist. Of course, but I really like what I'm doing now. Okay. Uh, and that is where I would like to focus my interests more instead of trying to bring back something that doesn't need to come back yet. Mm. You know what I mean? No one's clamoring for it in the same way that I feel I'm getting attention on this about the, uh, the, I don't know, the, the unusual nature that is drag box TV. What it is that we do every Wednesday and the show is we play Jackbox TV games live on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch for everyone's viewer enjoyment. And we bring some of your favorite, uh, you know, drag queens and queer people on and um, just relax. You know, we like let go for a few, two hours and we just play games and we don't uh, have to be so serious and it doesn't have to be a drag that's so physically intense. Um, And, you know, girls don't even have to get into drag, but I'm honored when they do put on a face because at least we can all take pictures. Um... And uh, I love we're lo- uh, drag box is just the coolest like way to get people together in a space virtually. Uh, still say you're doing drag and uh, still get to socialize. And uh, a lot of times there's been a lot of things I've realized. One is that drag queens actually like each other. Some of them in person. Um, <laughs> sometimes. sometimes. And, they, they act and, like they do, but then they talk shit about each other. <laughs> Yeah, but ultimately, I think there are a lot of people who do make some really good friendships. And a lot of times in this business, you don't get a chance to, like, hang out with those folks unless you're working with them every night. And how many folks get to work every night? Um, So there's just a limit on what uh, was allowed, right? How many nights a week you could work was only a is only contingent upon how many shows and venues there are in New York. Uh, producing drag shows and willing to produce them. And with virtual drag, that changed entirely. Um, And I think it's smart to not let go of that as we start to reopen. Um, I think a lot of people are like, oh, yes, I'd much rather watch it this way. Um, For many reasons, right? People don't want, people want to support you in the middle of the week, but like, they got work the next day. Oh my God, the struggle is so real. <laughs> right? I'm about to start a job where I start at uh, eight in the morning. I'll be up at six o'clock. Like, yep. I'm not going to have time to go to the bar, especially Hell's Kitchen or the West Village. That's crazy for Why you. Why is Hell's Kitchen so far away? Like, I live on the east side. I don't even live that far away from it, and it's still far. <laughs> and it's hard to be going to these bars, and then, like, if you're. If you're sober, right, like, there's, mm-hmm. there is, like, alcohol all around you. Yeah. If you try to drink casually but, like, you know, have responsibilities, it's also hard because you don't want to drink too much, but you don't want to not support the venue. So weekdays can be hard for people. The bar situation can be hard for people. As much as I love the bars, I get why it's why it's limiting and i think virtual drag kind of opens those doors and allows more people in um it was it was a message that i had when i won miss stonewall which is uh no matter who you are where you come from as long as there's love in your heart there's a place for you at the stonewall well then look what happened you know Mm -hmm. now if you love this if you love this world you can be part of it and not have to be 21 years old to enter a space right look at what this does for younger audiences Mm -hmm. many of these places as emmy great has pointed out before are not uh uh ada accessible so um true what are you this leaves a disabled community out of uh, queer spaces many of the time. Mm-hmm. Um, look what virtual drag has done. And we're, I don't think it's a smart idea to let that go. I don't think so. Um, it doesn't work. Well, I think you're like, Dragbox is a different take on digital drag because I find most digital drag to be a little bit exhausting. But I like Dragbox because it's more like, it's not just people performing to a camera. It's like mm-hmm. games that are interactive and it's just a fun kiki time like it's a different take on what digital drag could be because i feel like digital drag seems very limiting but you figured out a way to like push past those limits thank you um 
I agree with your sentiment about some of these virtual drag shows being exhausting. I do not. <laughs> I, I don't think it's wise to do the same kind of show to the camera. Agree. Um, I agree. Unless you like have a background in doing it and can do it well, but the average, you know, run of the mill performer probably doesn't have like editing skills, lighting skills, all of that. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm talking about live shows. I'm talking about oh, live, live shows. Gotcha. Live shows. I mean, you see these girls doing live shows, doing the bop, 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 oh, bop, yeah. bop, bop. <laughs> you know, like, I, I, I don't know, just like, I'm missing why you're doing this. I'm missing <laughs> the excitement of it being in the venue and, like, actually my physical safety being threatened. Like, that's part of it. With these girls. I've said it before. I'll say it again. I think digital drag peaked when the girl fell asleep on live and was <laughs> live for, like, several... I think hours after that point. I don't know what happened. Um, <laughs> she but, made so much money, though. Yeah, that was... I, I forget her name off the top of my head, but um, an iconic moment, and that's when we should have stopped doing the <laughs> <laughs> no it was pretty amazing it was uh <laughs> um but i wanted to say because um you had us on drag box back in january and uh i think i can speak for both me and caitlin that we enjoyed the experience a lot and it was yeah. very kind for you to reach out but i loved what your sentiment that night um when you said it was like a community builder for other performers in the scene and such especially since um our, ours is like right after the Capitol riot um so yep. Uh, it was much needed at that point to have like a community backbone. Um, so I think what you're doing with Dragbox is um, very commendable and very needed in this way, in this time. And I and I'm honored that so many folks have taken the step and have said yes. I can't tell you how many folks leave me on red. Yep. Um, I'm man. sure. I mean, you know what? I probably <laughs> speaking to the right people. Yeah, I know. Dude, wait, I know more. I probably know more than anybody. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, when you're an independent young artist without much of a following, trying to bring folks together, uh, yeah. a lot of the times, right? You don't get that same. Uh, respect from people. I think some of this has come from that title that I have. And like I said, let's pass that down to somebody. Yeah. Because now, if a girl who doesn't have a title now gets her first, amazing. Now people will start to like look at her a little differently. People who have been in the business will want to understand her a little more, uh, or or him, or them, right? Uh, yeah. And I and I hope. And I hope we can get to that because I think that's kind of what the idea of pageantry uh, could be so successful at. But like, I'm going to say it. I don't care who hears it. Some of this pageantry in person has been irresponsible. Mm. Like fully. And they know who they are. And I'm not calling any pageants out by name. And I would like to one day compete in some of these pageants. But this was not the time and i'm not afraid to say it i understand oh we took precautions and we're safe guess what there are people who are not able to enter because of physical conditions and you're going to make this an ableist moment where people who have physical strength and and are willing to take the risk and have the flexibility to take that risk uh to compete um you're again leaving out a segment of your entertaining base. You're, I, I think it's irresponsible. I think it's non-inclusive. I think it should be called out for what it is. I'm actually shocked that with all the outrage that the gay community likes to have about bullshit, that they would not say anything about this. Mm -hmm. I think it's, I think it's too much. I think it's too much. We want to talk about, you know, that person from season 12 a lot. But we never want to, but we never want to actually like address like that issue. Like we okay. never, we just want to hear more gossip, but we don't want to like fix the loophole that like allowed that to happen. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um, because we don't want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's what drag box is doing to like loop back, right? Like yeah, it yeah. allows these doors to be open where now we can have this conversation Thank because you. we got closer on a, on a silly little game show that led to that. And there are people who have never worked together on this sh or never met each other, but before the show, and now they know each other, what relationships will those spark? Because certain people and certain groups of nightlife kind of steer the conversation all the time 100 <laughs> percent. and i just don't think life is worth living according to someone else yeah um and if there's people who have 
smart things to bring to conversations, let's let them share that, right? Like, yeah. fuck, I just think that, like nightlife is New York City is so so um segment it's not just segment it's separate it's it's divided oh, it's it's not it, it doesn't allow for voice um so i'm i'm liking i like our show i like what we do and we're going to continue to do it for as long as i can and as long as i want to and now we are family members because we are all part of the work.com family <laughs> yes i'm now uh the wednesday night show for work tv on youtube yeah. um and that's really cool uh and i've kind of been granted the like free reign of wednesdays that's so, right uh, oh, there's gonna be, <laughs> gonna be a few more things um aria and i are gonna launch a show that we're tentatively calling board queens as oh, we play okay. board games Ooh. um and then we want to bring other people like like this will be more like a one camera live in person kind of thing where we're in the same space and friends come over and we're playing things like Ticket to Ride or Monopoly or Candyland or Sorry or Be a Broadway Star um, and like doing that on a Wednesday night um, and <laughs> so love. now that things are opening again and people can be in person we can do a show like that where we can play these games because that's where this all started I yeah. don't think I got to explain that yeah. Aria and I and Pussy Willow and Andy Starling had this idea for Board Queens Mm -hmm. that was where this came from we wanted to do it pandemic hit and then we didn't really think of how we could do it you know andy had to be cautious uh i was working um they were uh being cautious for their own reasons so like we didn't get to build it we didn't know how to start yeah. I started a drag box we're like but we still want to do this so now it's a way for us to do the thing we always wanted to do with the world being the way it is mm -hmm. <laughs> the struggle is real <laughs> so what would be the best advice you've ever been given about drag um one don't get caught dead without earrings <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hear that, Martyr? <laughs> I have one now. I don't know. <laughs> you can wear clip ons. Like, I'm going to tell you my story. I say it all the time. Uh, I met Junior Mint and I was like, uh, oh, perfect. There's this one right here. I need that one. Um, so I met Junior Mint at this show and I was like, this bitch is a spectacular star. And um, we were like doing the thing and she's about to go on stage without earrings. And I was like, you need earrings so i gave her i had a gold pair of these and i gave them to her to put them on she looked beautiful better than me always and uh so uh i don't know i just felt like that was a moment where i made a really good friend by doing something a piece of drag advice uh, but like <laughs> the best drag advice i ever gotten was i guess from christy blaze which was always like be yourself and be true to yourself um take care of yourself like it, drag is really and this is why maybe we are so segmented and divided but for people who have the capacity to do this long term there really has to be an individual focus there has to be a focus on your own health your own sense of being outside of the clothes and the and the the face right um and that goes back into that loophole i mentioned of like certain people rise so fast and like certain things aren't being dealt with you know what yeah. i mean um i'm gonna be celebrating four years of drag in may but i've wanted to see a therapist for all four of those years and why did it just take me until january of this year you know so yeah. where there are it is but that is part of the journey and as drag queens we get to live that and you don't have to go so fast you don't you just get to you just you get to do you on your own terms uh polish the queen really was that competition that taught me that and that 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 circle of people you know all the judges they had all these old school queens that i've met through that and i don't want to call them old school and then give them names because they're gonna be like i am not old but, <laughs> you know and they know who they are if they remember who i am but um i remember all the advice that all these pageant girls gave me you know because it's about it's not doing drag uh is to me, uh, I'll speak for myself, it is about your human 
connection mm -hmm. to the world. Um, and so if you are depressed and if you are anxious, that will reflect on your drag. Um, that's not necessarily a terrible thing. Um, it's a, everything is a learning thing, but it is so much like stemmed in like your relationship to the world and people around you and the things happening and, um, what a cool fucking thing to get to do, right? Is there anything else? Is there anything else like that where like the work that you create is really so stemmed in day-to-day -day world? Like music can be edited, songs can be rewritten. You put on your face and you go out and the moment you step outside, it's done. You, you can change it, but that mo other moment still existed permanently. That is some deep shit. <laughs> it That's definitely a reflects episode. a lot of what <laughs> I think about drag as well. As someone who consumes it. <laughs> mm -hmm. it's your moment. That's my, this is my moment. Don't steal it away. Okay. Miss Sissy. Martyr's allowed one question per one episode. Question, one question per episode. <laughs> like I said, it's in my contract. Um, <laughs> Miss Sissy, can you give us a story that, um, like what's one nightlife story or something you've seen in nightlife that like sticks in your brain as something crazy, mem memorable, um, insane. Give us something juicy. Give us something tantalizing. Um, how about the first invasion I had at Stonewall where people thought Lady Gaga was supposed to be there that night? <laughs> <What>? <laughs> okay. There was some type of rumor that she was gonna do a pop-up concert at the Stonewall I'm not kidding. There was another tweet that went out. Oh, this blonde girl all covered up walked in. And that was me. And that was me. <laughs> I had this show and I had worn my blonde hair that I wore to Miss Stonewall and I put my sunglasses on because Chauncey was like, where are you? And I was like, I'll be there in a few minutes. Like it was a six o'clock or it was an hour before the show. And I was like, I'll be there in like 20 minutes. And he's like, it's being packed and I was so nervous my first solo show at the stone wall wall to wall people because they expect lady fucking God. <laughs> some homo had a pink cowboy hat that oh fucking lit God. up okay <laughs> it was the season of Joanne and they were into it and I was like uh, and Chauncey was like, you have to just give them the show that you came here to do. And I did. And I forget what my, I think my first number was my Miss Stonewall mix. And then, um, then probably my Celine Dion one. I'm not, oh no. Um, I think it was, I, I think about you, Patty LaBelle. Um, and I was like, this is this fucking show I came to open with y'all. Um, so play? that was, that was, oh, we did the whole show and it was a beautiful night and we were talking family and I, you know, I had all my sisters backstage with me. We were talking family and um, just doing it and living life. You know what I mean? Just living, like doing the best we could. Um, and I had fun with it and I missed shows in person really bad but that was that was a great uh memory of nightlife i'll never forget i feel like there's obviously so many other things i've seen i've seen octavia anye hold on to the two railings of the steps at stonewall going down into the seating area of the second floor and she literally spun like hands like this on the railing and then her legs were spinning in a fucking circle like she was doing like the most intense pilates like <laughs> fucking reformer machine work you've ever seen uh and Cha and it was to uh the last the big love mm -hmm. on uh and i'm telling you i'm not going like you're gonna love and chauncey just fucking pressed like cycle repeat cycle repeat. <laughs> so the note was being held for ever and ever and ever and ever and octavia anye is like spinning her fucking legs like a goddamn washing machine <laughs> or over the steps in the second floor and I and she won the lip sync. She beat Zarya, and it was like such a close lip sync because Zarya is an assassin on the stage, and it was contested. People are like, "No way!" And I was like, "Oh my god!" It was it that was a wild fucking showdown. Um, God, what else? I've seen 
I've seen people fight at Barracuda, like in the middle of people's numbers. I've seen <laughs> Tina, I've seen Tina Burner flip the f out. I would have wanted um, to mess with Tina. I've seen Shaquita kick people out of the front row. I uh, feel like I, everyone's seen that. I certainly have. <laughs> um, I've seen. God, I haven't seen. I mean, I've seen enough, but I haven't seen everything. <laughs> um, I think you're good. <laughs> yeah, I got. I mean, I miss, it. I miss it all. I can't wait to get back and see things. Yeah. Maybe, you know. I know, right? Uh, I was at the Rosemont the other day for the first time in like a year, and that was just surreal. So. <laughs> I, I'm glad things are opening it up, but um, it's going to take some time before it feels normal again. Yep. But, yeah. And that's it. That's all you can do is just wait and, and, and then do what you can do. So our last question is, where do you want to take your drag in the future? I think the future of the American home is growing exceedingly queer, and yeah. I think uh, that is where I want to take my drag to be a household name. Um, yeah. And in what capacity, I don't know. Um, am I on television? Am I making a product that sells somewhere? Am I? I. I don't know. Am I still? Am I still singing at venues and going around the country? Wouldn't that be nice? Um, but I don't know. I just know that that's what needs to happen. That's what informs the work. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's there's no uh, there's no other thing I think is more important to focus on for my drag except you know uh, reach people, reach people, reach people where they're at. That's what politics is too. It's reaching people where they're at. It is not. Um, it is not always just standing in the back and making your own beautiful, crazy shit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if it's not accessible, if it's not digestible, you know, you've just made it for yourself. Mm -hmm. And the, the thing about art is that it's worth sharing. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's, ex you know, it is, it is always worth sharing. As personal as some things may feel, like part of sharing it tells that story or I don't know um that's just I just uh fucking love this life you know I love I love what I do and I'm gonna continue to do it in the same way I've done it before uh hopefully you know a little more uh making a little more money that's it Tea. amen to that <laughs> <laughs> oh god all I want is to make a little more money doing this so the struggle's real <laughs> it's real Oh gosh. Um, well, thank you so much for coming on our little show. We thank you for having me. I love your show. I, well, I just finished listening to your interview with Ruby. Um, oh yeah. It was that intense. That was so fascinating because, <laughs> I mean, yes, it was intent. I, but like, who knew what kind of an amazing individual she is like mm -hmm. her story, you know, like yeah. tell stories. Uh, God, there's so many musicals about stories that make me think of moments like, like this, like like what we're doing, right? Like things like shows like Hamilton and Aida, where there's so much focus about the history of your life and and how it's told and who it's told by and yep. and um. Who lives? Who dies? Before we go, I just wanna I if I could make this quick point and kind yeah, of and close this up. I I heard this argument this morning about the Gen Zers trying to cancel Eminem. Oh, I, of course. <laughs> Based on the song with Rihanna from all of this time ago, about 10 oh, years wow. ago. <laughs> Do you remember the song Love the, the Way You Lie? Where he I listened out. to that song a lot. I, it's, mm -hmm. It was always problematic. And, you know, it was, but Rihanna had always said, like, um, and I'm not trying to put words in her mouth, but that yeah. this was a song that tells the truth and it was a reflection about a time of her life that she lived in. Mm -hmm. um, it was a truth-telling moment. Um, yeah. And... I think that whole part of that dialogue disappeared after 10 years mm -hmm. and we're coming back now. Like people are like questioning this and we have to rehab this conversation. And what it tells me is in a moment like that about where we've lost our sense of the discourse and mm -hmm. uh, of, of remembering the conversations we have. So we're not talking in circles. I see it in my personal life and now I'm seeing it on a societal level, the macro and the micro. I, I, and 
ultimately what we are telling to each other and the stories that we share are important to share and to continue to share and reshare because we can't lose them. We can't lose the stories of people like crazy season 12 nut job or the amazing stories of um ruby ridiculous right like mm -hmm. we get to hear both of these things in conjunction with ourselves because we as queer people have stories that are worth telling because we've lost generations who didn't get to tell their stories so we must do this work all the time and i thank you all for having me Aww. because this is this is the this is the shit this is the good shit so thank you <laughs> well, thank you <laughs> Um, where can the kids find you online? You can find me at all social media platforms at Miss Sissy Walken. That's M I S S C I S S Y because I love you and I hope you love me too. W A L K E N. That's hey. it. <laughs> hey, um, I met that. I say it like I'm in the bars again. Um, I wish I could sign. I don't. I'm, that's another thing I've procrastinated on. One day I'll learn how to sign and be able to spell my name in ASL. M I S S C I S S Y W A L K. Is it E N? E N. Mark here is signing, by the way, the <laughs> audio <laughs> podcast. I know. I know. I know. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> It's a it's a one little thing I like to flex every once in a while because I can do it. But um, yeah, I just watched a video of the uh, drag queens, the deaf drag queen uh, Ooh, girls. Wait. They uh, they oh. make videos and they're they're like so cool. I like like watching them. Just, <laughs> they're, they're just a funny group of girls. And even though they're um, they're signing, like you don't miss out on any of the humor, or the shade, or you can mm -hmm. he you you can still feel it. You know what I mean? You still. Mm -hmm. You're like when she goes like this and like you kind of hear Ooh, like i don't know i hear it at least it's it's wonderful it's the future of drag mm -hmm. so Ooh. accessibility i, I love that um well i was martyr i was c tepper and this was wig it out yeah. goodbye <laughs>